National Communications Network in collaboration with the National Center for Resource Development and the Ministry of Education present CXC in Focus, a focus on the key subject areas of mathematics and English for students preparing to write the exams. Welcome to another program in the series CXC Mathematics in Focus. In today's lesson, we'll continue looking at consumer arithmetic, this time looking at simple interest. This lesson involves the calculation of simple interest. If you have extra money, you can invest it in a bank or building society, and a payment is made for its use. If you borrow money from a bank or a building society, you are expected to pay for the service. A sum of money invested or borrowed is called the principal. We denote this by capital P. The money earned by the principal is called the interest. We denote this by a capital I. Interest is normally calculated at a rate per cent per annum. We denote the rate by capital R. The period of time for which money is kept is called time. Time is denoted by capital T. The principal plus the interest is called the amount. We denote the amount by capital A. There are many ways in which interest is calculated and paid. We will be looking at the simplest of the methods used. It is called simple interest. We denote simple interest by a capital I. Here's our first example. Mr. Booker deposited $15,000 in a bank for four years at 5% per annum. Calculate the simple interest. Here's the solution. Interest received at the end of year one would be 5% of $15,000, or 5 over 100 times $15,000. The interest received at the end of four years would be 5 over 100 times 15,000 times four. This will work out to be $3,000. We have calculated simple interest using the formula rate times principal times time, time always expressed in years, all divided by 100. Using the simple interest formula, that is interest I is equal to R times P times T divided by 100, which will be interest is equal to rate multiply by principal, multiply by time, divided by 100. And in short, it can be expressed as PRT divided by 100. Our second, second example, Mr. Bob deposited $20,000 in his account at a bank that offers 6% per annum simple interest. Calculate the amount of money he will receive at the end of 15 months. The solution. Principal, which is P, is equal to $20,000. Rate percent per annum is equal to 6%. So we say R is equal to 6%. Time, I explained earlier, must be expressed in years. So the time being 15 months, we'll convert 15 months to years, which would be 15 divided by 
12, which will give us 1.25 years. Simple interest, the formula is I is equal to rate times principal times time divided by 100. In this case, your principal is $20,000. Your rate is 6% and your time is 1.25 years. So it is 20,000 times 6 times 1.25 divided by 100. And when this is calculated, we have an answer 1,500. Amount is equal to principal plus interest, which is P plus I, which is equal to $20,000 plus $1,500, which will give us $21,500. The amount Mr. Bob will receive at the end of 15 months is $21,500. When using simple interest formula, rate must be expressed as a percentage and time in years. In summary, we have noted that simple interest I, principal P, rate percent per annum R, or time in years can be calculated using the formula I is equal to PRT divided by 100. And the amount is equal to your principal plus your interest. Here is a solution to the problem given in the last lesson. To calculate A, it's the unit price times the quantity, unit price being $12.50, times three, $12.50 times three is equal to $37.50. B is equal to your total cost divided by quantity, which is equal to $33.90 divided by two, which will give us $16.95. C is calculated as the total cost divided by the unit price, which is $31 divided by $6.20, which will give us $31 over $6.20, or you can say $3,100 over $6.20, shifting the decimal two places to the right for the numerator as well as the denominator, and that will give us an answer five. To calculate the value of D, we find 15% of $108.28, which will be 15 over 100 times $108.28. And when that calculation is done, we have $16.24. Selling price for six stickers at 75 cents each will be 75 cents multiplied by six, which will give us $4.50. Selling price for six stickers at 40 cents each is equal to 40 cents times six, which will give us $2.40. Total selling price for the stickers is equal to $4.50 plus $2.40 which will give us $6.90. Since the buying price was $5.88, Amanda made a profit. This is your problem for today. Mr. Mitchell deposited $40,000 in a bank and earned simple interest at 7% per annum for two years calculate the amount he will receive at the end of the two-year period. This question is taken from CXC June 2004. This brings us to 
the end of today's program, CXE Mathematics in Focus. On behalf of the team, Joe McKenzie, Peter Wintz, Rajwanti Permal, I wish to invite you to join me tomorrow for another program, CXE Mathematics in Focus. In previous lessons, we have examined the kinds of questions or stimuli that CXC uses in section three of paper two of the CSEC English A examination, commonly referred to as the short story section. We have discussed the meaning and relevance of plot, setting, and characterization. In today's lesson, we will attempt to understand the meaning of the term point of view and to explain the importance of this idea in the writing of a good short story. Point of view refers to the way a story is told, the mode or perspective established by the writer by means of which the reader is presented with the characters, events, details, and setting. Of course, someone has to tell the story. In this case, when you're writing the examination, you are Mr. X or Miss Y. When you come to write the story in section three, you may take on the personality of someone else. This personality is who is telling the story, and we generally classify point of view as first person point of view or first person narration and third person point of view or third person narration. To understand these concepts better, we need to look at some of the topics that may be set in this section of the paper. And of course, we need to refer to the two stories that we read in lessons nine and 10. The story after 20 years begins this way. The policeman on the beat moved up the avenue slowly the time was barely 10 o'clock at night, but chilly gusts of wind with a taste of rain in them had well nigh emptied the streets. Someone is telling us about the policeman and his meeting with Silky Bob. The teller of the story, however, is not part of the story. Such a story is told from a third person point of view. The narrator then does not participate in the story, but he or she knows what will happen in the end. In a way, the narrator is like God. He or she creates all the characters, all the places, all the actions, and all the events. Generally, in such a story, the characters are referred to by name, or he, she, it, or they. Your job here is to choose carefully the story you are going to write and decide from whose point of view you will tell the story. For example, if you are provided with the following picture and asked to write a story based on the picture, how will you approach the telling of the story? From whose point of view will you tell the story? Obviously, there is a young boy and a young girl and a kite. They are trying to raise the kite. Who will tell the story? Here are some ideas. The story can be told from a third person point of view, as if someone is looking at the unfolding of events from above. Such a story will use the names of the boy and the girl and refer to the kite as it. 
such a story may begin this way. Of course, there are a million ways to begin any story. As soon as morning broke, John was awakened by the shrill cries of neighbor Patsy's fall cocks. In a matter of minutes, he and his tomboy sister of six, Jenny, were hurtling through the empty lot, aiming for the vast field on which the competition was to be held. The teller of the story allows the story to unfold without making us know who he or she is. Look at the picture carefully. The story can be told by the young boy Tom who recalls the events of a particular day or occasion not long after such events happen. In this case, the story is told from a first person point of view. Such a point of view would be colored by the fact that Tom is young, middle class, healthy and fun loving, or that John is young, poor, abandoned and given to bouts of depression, or that John is young, pampered, spoiled and happy and angry, or that John is young, fun loving, charming but terminally ill or any of a combination of a thousand qualities. Similarly, the story can be told by the young sister or neighbor or sister or sweetheart. As in the case of John, the young lady can be a combination of many things or many different qualities. Needless to say, the narrator would have to tell the story by using I as the main person rather than he or she or it. A more sophisticated student, one who has read a number of stories and understands much about short story writing, may want to write the story through the I personality, but may tell the story as an older man or older woman who is looking back at a particular episode when he or she was just a child. Such a story may very well begin this way. Whenever Easter comes, I thank the Lord for Jenny. Not that I don't thank the Lord regularly for her, in a most special way. At 72 years of age, bald and creaking at the bones, I often open this silver-colored album and stare at this picture taken 63 years ago. A much more sophisticated student, one who has internalized a number of stories and who has practiced writing stories in a variety of ways, may also want to write a story through the I personality, but may tell the story from the per point of view of the kite. In actual fact, the kite is telling the story, although you, the students, are writing the story in the examination room. One stimulus or topic from the May-June 2004 examination reads as follows. That was the last of them. From that moment onwards, life was different for us. Write a story that begins or ends with the sentence above. Obviously, your narrative will be from the point of view of one of the us. The narrative voice would either be we or I as a major player in the group. You can be one of a number of personalities, a young boy or girl, young man or woman, an old man or woman, a member of a gang, an underprivileged or oppressed class, or even a robot. The them could be a group that is essentially good or essentially evil. There are hundreds of personalities we could pretend to be, but the point of view is first person, either singular or plural. Another example 
is taken from the May-June examination of 2000. Number six of this section three says, I beg your pardon, I never promised you a rose garden. Write a story based on this statement. There are two choices of view using the narrative. I, in which either you or another character says the words, I beg your pardon. I never promised you a rose garden. Or you, as the student writing the examination, could tell the story from a third person point of view using he or she, in which either the main character or a minor one express the sentiments of the statement with the rose garden. Obviously, you should be aware that the story should have nothing to do with an actual rose garden, for this term is a metaphorical one. We wish to end this lesson by drawing to your attention a common but grave error often made by students at this level. For example, number six of section three of the May June 2001 English A Paper 2 says, Hero, heroine for the day. Write a story on the topic above. You begin to write the story using a third person point of view, using he or she as the main character. Suddenly, halfway through or further along the story, you switch to the I narrator as the person telling the story. This may arise because you are telling a story based on personal experience. This sudden shift throws your story off balance and reveals that you are not in control of the point of view element of your story. Be clear in your mind about who is telling the story. Boys and girls, on behalf of the team Bibi Ali, Parmeshwar Lal, and Ron Chichester, I'm Ingrid Pong saying thank you for viewing. The National Communications Network, in collaboration with the National Center for Resource Development and the Ministry of Education, presents CXC in Focus, a focus on the key subject areas of mathematics and English for students preparing to write the exams. Welcome to another program of CXC Mathematics in Focus. We will continue to look at consumer arithmetic. We are at lesson 14 today. Today we'll be looking at compound interest and depreciation. This lesson involves the calculation of compound interest and depreciation. When you borrow money from a bank, you pay interest. If you want to know how much interest you will pay above the cost of the principal amount on the loan, you will need to understand and know how compound interest works. In compound interest, the principal increases every year. The interest also increases every year. Example, if a principal of $100,000 is deposited into a fixed account and gains interest at the rate of 10% per annum, calculate the compound interest at the end of two years. Here's the solution. The principal we know is $100,000. The first year interest 
is 10% of $100,000, which is one-tenth of $100,000, which will give us $10,000. The principal at the beginning of the second year is equal to the first year principal plus the first year interest, which will be $100,000 plus $10,000, which will give us $110,000. From this, we can calculate the second year interest. So the second year's interest is now 10% of $110,000, which is one-tenth of $110,000. This will work out to be $11,000. So the compound interest would be the first year interest plus the second year interest. The first year interest being $10,000 and the second year interest being $11,000, together we will have $21,000. Depreciation. Assets such as cars, electrical appliances, houses, and furniture tend to decrease in value over time as a result of wear and tear. The loss in value is called depreciation. Similarly, when assets increase in value over time, the increase, increase in value is referred to as appreciation. Example one, a television bought for $80,000 depreciates in value at the rate of 10% each year. Determine its value after two years. Here's the solution. The original price of the television or the TV is $80,000. First year depreciation is equal to 10% of $80,000, which is equal to 10 over 100 times $80,000, which is equal to $8,000. The value of the TV at the beginning of the second year will be the $80,000 minus the $8,000, that's the value of the depreciation, which will give us $72,000. The second year depreciation will be calculated as 10% of $72,000, which is 10% or 10 over 100 times $72,000, which will give us $7,200. The value of the TV after two years is equal to the value of the TV at the beginning of the second year minus depreciation during the second year. Means that we have to subtract $7,200 from $72,000, which will give us $64,800. Example two, Mr. Williams bought a plot of land for $40,000. The value of the land appreciated by 7% each year. Calculate the value of the land after a period of two years. This question is taken from CXE January 2004. Here's the solution to the problem. The initial cost of the land is $40,000. Appreciation for the first year will be 7% of $40,000, which is equal to 7% or 7 over 100 times $40,000, which will give us $2,800. The value of land at the beginning of the second year is equal to the initial cost plus the appreciation for the first year, which is equal to $40,000 plus $2,800 
which will give us $42,800. Appreciation for the second year is equal to 7% of $42,000, which is 7 over 100 times $42,000, which will give us $2,996. So the value of land after a period of two years is equal to the value at the beginning of the second year plus appreciation for the second year. This will give us $42,800 plus $2,996, which will give us a total of $45,796. This is your problem for today. The table below gives information on the values and the rates of depreciation in value of two motor vehicles. In the first column, you have the motor vehicle. In the second column, you have the initial value. The third column, you have the yearly rate of depreciation. And in the last column, the value after one year. You are given a taxi whose initial value is $40,000, whose yearly depreciation is 12%, and whose value after one year is P dollars. You are required to find the value of P. The private car, its initial value is $25,000. The yearly depreciation is Q percent. The value of that private car after one year is $21,250. We are required here to calculate the value of Q. Here it is stated for you. Calculate the value of P and Q and the value of the taxi after two years. This question is taken from CXC June 2006. This brings us to the end of today's program, CXC Mathematics in Focus. We have seen how important it is to understand and to pay close attention to the ideas or concepts of plot, characterization, setting, and the point of view in the writing of the short story. In this lesson, we are going to discuss certain specific areas of narrative technique that are essential for you to write a successful story at the CXC level. By the term narrative technique, we refer to the way in which the story is told. Of course, point of view is an important part of how a story is told, because you have to decide who is telling the story. And back of course. Mm. Of course, point of view is an important part of how a story is told, because you have to decide who is telling the story. We have looked at this in detail in the previous lesson. One of the most widely used technique in short story writing is what is generally referred to as flashback. This can be best illustrated by looking at two questions from past examination papers. The May-June 1998 English A paper has the following at number five. Write a story entitled, The Day My Grandmother's House Burned Down. You may want to go straight into the story and tell the story, beginning with the day. This is fine. It is a technique that is direct and focuses on the action straight away. This is recommended. However, 
you may wish to assume the personality of an older person as the teller of the story. Perhaps in a conversation with an older person, the name of your grandmother comes up and you remember the tragic day. You need to recall the tragic events. The bulk of the story then is the emphasis on that particular day. This major event, the real story, is boxed in by an introductory segment that is in the present in which you are talking with the older person and a concluding segment also in the present in which the conversation ends. The bulk of the story, the day your grandmother's house burned down, constitutes the flashback. Another technique that is popular among writers of this short story is the use of physical description to create a particular atmosphere. In the story, after 20 years, the street or avenue is barely lit and lonely. There is high wind and a hint of rain. Silky Bob stands in a place in which his face is difficult to recognize. This creates an atmosphere of mystery and dread. In the story of the old man and his granddaughter, we find lush vegetation in a monotonous shade of green, a long, lonely, and winding road, a tiny abandoned shack overwhelmed by clinging green vines. Clearly, such a description creates an atmosphere of loneliness, abandonment, and depression. Coincidence is another technique used widely in the short story. For example, in a short story entitled The Trap, the wicked person may just be leaving a scene just as the police are arriving. Or just on the point of discovering the trap, the hero is forestalled by an accident. Whatever coincidences you use, they must appear to be natural, not contrived. In some stories, you may want to refer to events or personalities in the past. Such terms as Judas, Rowan, Cleopatra, Helen of Troy, the prodigal son, the good Samaritan, the Taliban, the Crusaders, the Jonestown tragedy, and others are usually referred to as allusions. You must be careful in the use of such references. Any of the number of local myths and superstitions may also be used in your stories depending on the topic you choose to write on. The Bush Daidai, the Masakurimon, the Ubiquitous Dutchman, the Nungeza, the Sok Sok, the Obia Man, and such characters can be used in themselves to create an atmosphere of mystery, suspense, and dread. Finally, we will end this session by looking at the use of contrast to create desired effect as a narrative technique. For example, you can begin a story of a perfect day that leads to unexpected, almost unimaginable tragedy. You must be able to balance the description of the perfect day with the sudden, unexpected onslaught of terror and tragedy. In the May-June 2003, this stimulus is provided. You really can't tell a book by its cover. Addison turned out to be a real friend. Write a story that ends with these words. Obviously, the first part of the statement is a metaphorical one. They are not talking about a physical book. It should be obvious to you, the student, that contrast is a necessary narrative technique in a topic such as this one.
we are expected to reveal a series of incidents in which Addison is portrayed as someone who is not a friend, someone who is an irritant, an embarrassment, or an enemy. Only towards the end of the story, possibly the final or third or one quarter, you are expected to reveal the important incidents or incident in which Addison proves to be a real friend. As a final reminder in this lesson, you need to choose your topic carefully, then determine what narrative techniques are best employed to create an interesting and successful short story. So boys and girls, until the next lesson, I'm Ingrid Pong saying goodbye on behalf of the team Bibiali, Parmeshwar Lal, and Ron Chichester. Thank you.